Um, hi everyone, my name is Abby Waddell. Um, I currently work as a digital forensics managing consultant, and I'm also the founder of Enquirix, uh, which provides research and um, services on OSINT vulnerability assessments, primarily for nonprofits. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about some open source intelligence techniques to locate the source of cyber breaches and the identity of cybercrime and non-cybercrime suspects that have been used successfully. Um, so why OSINT? So breach recon activities are not usually captured by existing tools and methods, either pre or post incident, mainly because such activities occur away from the corporate network. And what if you don't have a physical device uh, belonging to the suspect? So OSINT gathering can be put into uh, different categories according to the type of repository of data, the expected levels of permission and the level of sensitivity. So categories can include anything that's freely available to the public, data that's only meant to be shared with a specific group, for instance, most free deep websites, information that requires an applied for account in order to access it, such accounts require payment and or further screening uh, beyond a simple device um, verification, for example, paid for news or media sites, subscription sites. And then there's the data which is out in the open but shouldn't be. Uh, for example, um, uh, which is usually from unintentional leakage. So an example could be that I email um, a hotel reception about my room booking, but they reply to me, uh, including the email of a different customer um, by mistake. Or a web, a web page is misconfigured and shows a list of hidden uh, files and directories, which anyone can access if they are technically able to find the misconfigured URL. So I'll talk about some methods, uh, useful methods of obtaining information from documents, social media, password leak repositories um, and uh, websites and forums with some examples of how threat actors have been identified using these methods, which have been developed from years of research and original discovery. So first thing I'm gonna discuss some little tricks to reveal hidden material. Just to note that any blue rectangles covering the stuff in this present presentation are for redaction and privacy purposes along with any other changes that have been made to the viewable data. So for user profiles, images in uh, Instagram and Twitter, it's sometimes possible to reveal the parts of the image hidden by the way the image is presented on these platforms. So not everyone's profile photos show, uh, allow this to be done, but when they do, it can sometimes reveal useful information. So in the example on the left, uh, this person's neck tattoos are revealed, very useful if there is a need for identification. Um, the example on the right shows uh, more clearly the woman standing next to this user's photo. So it's, a, it's very simple to view the entire image, just save it locally and open it up from there, or you can open the photo from the platform in a separate browser window. Another useful trick is to be able to view a PDF um, file before any edits have been made using editing tools. So on the left is a PDF of an invoice from Amazon, and on the right, key details of the same document have been um, altered in order to uh, forge the invoice amount details and the delivery recipient. So the Edge browser PDF editing tool was used to do this. If one opens this document in Google Docs, however, not Google Drive, but Google, the, the preview, but the Google Docs, then this strips away uh, these edits so you can see the document as it was before the changes uh, were made. Crop screenshots and images within Microsoft files, such as PowerPoint, Excel, and Word documents can reveal the portions of the area deleted, but not completely removed. So low classification files can therefore still present a risk of sensitive data leakage, leading to reputational damage and so on. So examples of sensitive data should be anything, um, could be anything, sorry, visible on one's desktop at the time of either performing the screenshot or using images such as internal web directories in the URL visible in the browser, staff personal details, calendar entries, um, contents of open sensitive files and so on. So in this way, one can use this technique to find out more about the author and origin of any Microsoft created media that's under assessment. Um, so this is an example of how this happens. So the screenshot of the Enquirix logo is taken. Um, note the surrounding views of, of open websites and other documents. Um, the unwanted parts of the image are cropped, but then the user forgets to actively delete these cropped parts. So this is an easy mistake to make as it requires remembering to do this and manually doing this step in the application. 
And there's no software control um, uh, uh, that does this automatically. So this is a nifty free tool which can be obtained on the Inquiric site. It reveals those parts of the screenshots in uh, Microsoft files which have been cropped but not fully deleted. So you don't need to install anything um, and you only need to, uh, Microsoft Excel installed with uh, any third party add-ins disabled. So you basically just very simply upload any files you want checked. It will extract all the images, save them to a results file, um, and then you can view these images, um, which will show the full screenshot with any undeleted areas. So as can be seen from this example, the deleted or cropped parts of this image are revealed, um, and the yellow box surrounds what was intended to be viewed, but instead the whole screenshot prior to any cropping can be seen. So restricting editing rights within Microsoft uh, in, the, in the Microsoft program won't prevent this and there's no patch. So one useful method of getting intel on suspects is to use the account recovery function on applications as this sometimes reveals user details such as email addresses, usernames, um, device details. Um, it requires attempting to log into the website using the suspect's email address or username and then seeing what information comes back. So it's the offline equivalent of knocking on the front door of a suspect's house and seeing who answers. So there's no trespass or account compromise necessary. The examples here show the information returned on Facebook and Gmail when one goes through the steps to reset these users' passwords. Their passwords are not actually reset um, as you would stop the process at this point as it's enough to get the information shown, namely uh, partial email addresses and device phone numbers. And often it's possible to guess the redacted emails, even uh, having the, the last two digits and, and even having the last two, di two digits of the phone number can help corroborate information held elsewhere. And the same method uh, can be done on many applications. Uh, for example, the UK's British Telecom uh, BT website, only a username or phone number can be guessed here to get the redacted information. And likewise, Microsoft Office provides this kind of user data and is useful, uh, is a very useful source because it appears most of the world's computer users have a Microsoft account. So Twitter allows the guessing of someone's username, which is useful. And here is one of the UK's main banks providing clues as to the length of a user's password. So the user's NatWest customer account number, which is made up of, the, of their date of birth, is needed uh, it's needed to log into their NatWest account on the website. And then without needing to know any other information and you don't even need their password, one can see how many characters their password has when the application um, requests uh, various characters to be entered from this password. So knowing the length of this word can help guess their current password using previously leaked password data. And this password is likely to be used on other sites where the user has reused it. Obviously, this is more applicable to those who have a legal badge of authority to uh, get into a particular suspect's uh, device. So one way of tracing or profiling suspects is to look for matches of the writing they use. So this is an example of running a search of the exact wording used on the user profile of an advert of a particular malware vendor on Alphabay, um, which is then uh, get, which then gave some results of other black market sites that he was using. Um, so in this case, the wording of his terms and conditions are exactly the same on these other uh, banking hack sites. And it's also useful to determine the gender of the user by analyzing their writing through an online analysis tool such as Gender Guesser. So whilst this is not strictly OSINT, um, for those who already have legal access to a suspect's account, there are some sites worth exploring to get a better picture of their activities and their location. So Grammarly profiles may show draft documents, even with the free version. And these documents might contain personal details and other metadata. Fitness and sat-nav apps uh, can obviously show a user's location, including historic locations, not just in their vehicles, but um, if they set up walking or uh, jogging routes. Hotel, train, and flight booking sites are also good for location data. Um, it's also useful to link their current credit cards with physical addresses in use. So current email addresses um, as well. Um, I would estimate that the vast majority of users uh, in the UK and certainly in probably most other countries are registered in any one of the, the Tesco or your equivalent countries, big supermarket, uh, Amazon, BBC and, and the Netflix sites.
So understanding the sites where a suspect has registered can help with profiling them. For instance, if they have accounts on lifestyle and clothing sites, they're more likely to be women. Women make up 90% of the users on the popular Mumsnet site. Site registrations on sports sites tend to be uh, point to a higher likelihood of the user being male. Uh, parking apps may point to use or ownership of a car. And school sites like parent pay will, just, will show if they have kids. Um, national train um, and phone company sites uh, registrations may point to a country of origin. So just to reiterate that in these cases, we're looking to profile not just cyber criminals, but those who have committed other crimes such as drug trafficking, robbery, murder, and so on. Um, there's some techniques that can be used to discover the person behind a forum pseudonym. In the forum search area, you can do a search for the username plus the first two digits of the commonly used phone prefix for your country. For instance, Sammy1 and 07. So this may bring up uh, the person's phone number, in this case, a mobile number, and then search can be done on the entire number in Google and so on. In some instances, users mention uh, their email address in their messages. So a search for the at symbol is, is worthwhile. It's noticeable that people are much more cautious about mentioning their personal details in recent years than before. So it pays to research the oldest messages as well as the new ones where a user may uh, have been more likely to divulge pers personal information. Another technique is to search for the username plus the words for sale or wanted, because if this user has mentioned buying or selling, they sometimes uh, give clues as to where they live. So even a mention of a hometown may be enough to cross match this with their username to lead to results. Uh, users' avatar or motto in the intro or um, bio section could provide further clues as to who they are. Um, and some users mention landmarks near to where they live, um, and it sometimes becomes a simple case of deduction using online maps to work out their location. So we had one real example recently, a user mentioned in various posts and at various times over the years that he lived equidistant to three alternative energy farms, two miles south of a specific river, next to a railway line, near a newly built supermarket, and with a close view of a famous, uh, specific famous landmark. So then it was possible to triangulate with 95% accuracy his home address. Another useful technique is to scrutinize any uploaded media, for instance, images. Now, sometimes these images are hosted on uh, another server where their username, which may be different to the one they have on the forum that you're looking at, is visible in the URL. And further searches of this username on Google and popular deep websites may then point to their uh, real life identity. Often in forum discussions, especially with users who have been on the forum a while who have made a lot of posts, the other users may address uh, this user by their real name, either because they've met in person or because they've engaged in a lot of private messaging. So in one actual case, a user of interest was given a nickname by another user based on his surname because he knew who he was. A Google search was then run on this nickname, which then led to easy discovery of his real name. And then obviously uh, by, the, by this tone, uh, searches can be made in the forum uh, for the user for the username plus their sign-off words and abbreviations, and sometimes the user will let slip their real first name. So for example, Sammy1 and ATB for all the best, or uh, thanks, or THX, or take care, and so on. And sometimes they let slip their, their actual first name. Um, yeah. Um, the Skype online directory is a useful place to find details, such as alternative usernames, country location, and images and less useful, but still worth knowing, uh, torrent file names, which sometimes give away the user's operating system and username in the directory. And as mentioned before, one should always check links to media and other sites uh, from forum posts, as these can also give alternative usernames, such as in this example, where this particular user had a different username on the photo bucket site. Um, this is just to quickly highlight the benefits of using Bing Maps over Google Maps. So these are images, uh, example images of the same two map locations, and you can see how Bing Maps shows the colors in detail much more. So it's always worth using Bing for OSINT type work. Facebook is often a valuable information source, and this highlights uh, useful methods of doing this. So unlike the search functionality on most websites where there are more results with fewer search criteria, Facebook search produces more results the more the search parameters are defined. For instance, a search can be made of a standard phone prefix with the option to just look for content posted by that user checked. Um, and this will sometimes bring up past posts that the users 
the user has made uh, mentioning their full phone number on which further searches on other platforms can be made, which in turn can lead to finding out their other personal details. Um, to find employees working for a specific company as before, the more the search is defined, the, the, the greater the results. So the example shows uh, here, so shows um, all those who say in their profile they work for Electronic Arts and whose name contains the letter S. Checking the profile name as shown in the URL of a profile is worthwhile as this can show a person's maiden name, their middle name, um, uh, nickname, um, and also point to the uh, fact that the profile might be fake. Um, this is another example of having to add more search parameters in order to get any results. So a search here for Obeda 212 in this example comes back with no exact match. But refining the search, for instance, as in this case, specifying a year produces an exact match along with a retweeted post from Twitter. On Twitter itself, this post has actually been deleted, but it was actually de deleted, but it's still partially visible on Facebook. So Facebook's a useful place for finding deleted tweets. It's useful to know how to construct queries manually when the search parameters need to be more defined. So searches are made up of parameters which are then base64 encoded. Locations and user IDs have their own ID number as shown in these examples. Uh, location IDs can be found by running any search query using the platform search function and entering the location of choice, which um, after the base64 string in the URL can be decoded to get the specific numeric uh, ID for that location. And one can retrieve a user ID by viewing the HTML source code of the profile of interest and search in the source code for the user ID. So, um, sorry, I'm going back one. So um, this gives an example of a search query. Uh, so the word top here means all categories such as posts, people, or photos, but you could just have a single category. Um, the Q equals is followed by a keyword. And in this case, uh, it's knitting. Then the filters parameter, which refines the query can include a user ID, location ID, and exact dates. And the query is then base64 encoded and run from the URL. So to find contacts of a user who has prevented others from seeing their friends list, one can view any photos, images, and videos that may be present in their profile and view the list of users um, who have reacted to them via the likes, loves, comments, and so on. So with the list of friends, it's useful, especially if you um, have a case um, in the case of a man as they uh, do not usually change their surname after marriage to search for any users who have the same surname as the user. So um, as they, they're highly likely to be family members. So researching family members can then help to build um, a fuller picture of this user. Um, and where there are lots of photos in the profile of interest, it's useful to check only those uh, pictures which have a higher likelihood of having a greater number of users react with them, rather than having to wade through hundreds of photos which have minimal user reactions. So in general, there are certain types of photos which, which um, attract more user response than others. So photos showing close-ups of a face gener generally receive a higher number of user reactions, as do, photo, as do pictures of special occasions, um, um, also like, such as weddings and ceremonies, and people wearing smart or attractive looking clothing, um, and finally studio quality images. It's often useful to discern whether a social media account is fake. So fake profiles on Facebook and to a lesser extent, other social media sites tend to have the following hallmarks. And the greater number of these characteristics, then the greater likelihood the profile is not genuine. So uh, the join or first post date is relatively recent. So within the last few weeks or months, it's possible to backdate or hide Facebook posts. And so using the app that we've created, which I'll mention in the next slide, this can help to find the actual date a profile was created. The profile name is different to the profile name uh, as seen in the URL. As previously mentioned, this usually means that the name has been changed from what it originally was, which could have been the user's real name or the name of an account bought from a third party. Uh, the likes, photos, and posts are on a single topic. Fake profiles, especially those created um, for a single purpose, are usually dominated by one overriding theme. 
For instance, if a pro profile was created to market a particular brand of lawnmower, there would be predominantly photos of lawnmowers and likes around specific gardening and tools uh, businesses, but to the exclusion of much else. As such, you wouldn't find photos of the kids, the family holidays, mentions of other topics and so on. Um, the profile photo may even represent that particular topic rather than being of a person. Um, the posts and photos go over the top. So if a, if a fake profile belongs to someone who's keen to show the world that they are of a certain view and are of a certain type, their photos, mentions and likes, as with um, the point before, will often be single themed, but also exaggerated, perhaps to encourage others to believe that they conform to a standard social stereotype. And this is particularly in the case of those whose strong views may incur a lot of reactionary behavior from others. Um, there are no posts or photos or other content. So an empty profile may just mean that they haven't got around to populating the sections yet, or it may be a profile which only needs to be a bare bones one to fit a singular or temporary purpose. The person's age does not accord with the profile content. So there was an example of a fake, a, a fake account seen recently where the person was pretending to be a 19 year old man, but he said he was dating a college age woman who had a name which was common in the 1960s. Um, the friends are from a different culture, location, and possibly language, which is more obvious when a Facebook account has been bought from a third party. There are no friends who have the same surname. So most normal profiles have uh, some family members uh, shown as friends, and if there are no other friends showing the same surname, this may point to the account being fake. The presence of links to friends whose profiles are also fake, uh, particularly common if many of them are engaged in contentious activities. A reverse image search reveals the presence of the same image on other sites. Um, so this is uh, fake accounts may use stock images from uh, Google and, and so on. Profile pictures, uh, which do not show a clear image of the face. Depending on the purpose of the account, the presence of a thousand or more friends or under 20 friends may point to the account being fake. So too, fr too few friends may indicate that it was a recently created account. And too many may be due to the fact that the account has been bought secondhand or is being used for a single purpose, such as marketing or sales. If the account has been bought secondhand, there, are, there is more likely to be inconsistencies in the about section of the profile. So one should look at the location and timing of events to see if there's anything unusual. If there's no reply to private messages, then this may point to uh, the presence of a bot created account or an account created for a single purpose, for instance, putting likes on other pages. And single instances of, of all of this uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the account is fake. It's just any one of these factors would not ring alarm bells. It's when you have lots of them together, it becomes suspicious. The Facebook LinkedIn join day estimator tool, uh, which you can download for free from our site, can ascertain with 98% accuracy the date a profile was created on these platforms to within the closest 60 days. It's been updated since the slide, so now has a different user interface. So you basically enter the target profile's name and their join date will come back instantly. A profile's join date is not, is not readily available, even sometimes to the owner of a profile. It's only by cross-matching the platform's user ID number with the dates in the app can a user's join date be discovered. If a suspect profile has a join date that is very recent or much more recent than their stated posts, then this may point to the profile being fake. It's worth exploring um, the chain of contacts in a profile of interest in order to, ge to generate further profile leads. So as already mentioned on many profiles, it will not be possible to see the friends list of someone because the access level is restricted. In such cases, it's possible to retrieve some of the target profiles contacts through uh, the image and other content reactions. So in the diagram on the right, A is the start profile and B, C, D, E and F are A's first immediate first level friends of interest and their friends uh, are A's secondary level friends and their friends in turn are A's tertiary contacts. An example of how such analysis can assist in illicit trade research is this. So Janet Doe lives in New York and runs a shop which uh, has Greek and Roman antiquities for sale. It's suspected that she may uh, have links with dealers and others who are facilitating the sourcing and transport of stolen antiquities. Her Facebook settings have been configured to prevent her non-friends from viewing her friends list. A search of her name produces a list of 30 Facebook names who have, been, have made comments on her Facebook profile. A further search of these comments reveals that there is a user, Jerry Green, based in Munich, who owns a freight and storage company. A search of Jerry shows that he has many Facebook connections to people who work or live near archaeological sites in Turkey. And one of these contacts has videos and images of using and selling metal detecting equipment, 
and another contact here has advertised uh, unclean coins for sale. So by tracking the chain of contacts, it may be possible to surmise how and where Janet Doe is obtaining the antiquities for her store. So we've developed a Facebook profile Intel tool to automate this analysis. Uh, this scrapes a Facebook profile to show an at-a-glance view of a profile's contacts and their contacts in turn, and their interests and likes and so on. And keyword searches can also be done on the scraped data. It works entirely within the context of your Facebook credentials. And in this respect, you'll only be able to view the same details as if you logged on to Facebook in the normal way. Um, so you wouldn't be able to see person A's friends if you couldn't normally do this um, in the context of your uh, account. So at present, this, this tool, whilst it works, uh, runs far too slow. And some, so some further development work is needed. And when it works, other enhancements will also be added, such as uh, automatic language translation, quantifying how many times a particular profile um, has been added as a friend, image recognition, and contact location mapping. Search engine backlinks are often a, a useful way of generating leads and investigating breaches. So backlinks are inbound links to a website which get, at, which get added to a site's search engine ranking. And there are a number of sites which record these backlinks. So the higher the number of backlinks, the more votes the site has, which pushes it up the rankings. Um, they're also useful for showing old and current links uh, to a site along with relevant dates and times. So this example shows some backlinks to the anon.com anon site. And this site is often used as a repository for leaks, malware, um, and other nefarious files. And this is a screenshot of, a, of one particular link found which offered a, a file of leaked emails and passwords for download. These examples show uh, links to a carding site and a darknet hacking service site all found through backlinks. Publicly available lists of account leaks are useful when trying to ascertain more about a person or an identity. Uh, passwords often represent something which has a strong personal significance, such as family member's name, a favorite sports team, hobby, or meaningful date or location. In some leaked repos re repositories, it's possible to search under many different criteria, even when uh, the, data, the known data is sparse. So for instance, a search can be done on, a, on just a phone number, a surname, an email address, username, and IP address. Such repositories also allow lead generation of searches of potential suspects in com criminal matters. So in this example, the account list revealed hundreds of users globally who had chosen passwords which pointed to a very high likelihood of their involvement in specific crimes, such as terrorism, drug dealing, and child pornography. Recently, I conducted a study of passwords, uh, a study of thousands of leaked passwords and the gender of those that they belong to. Those passwords which contained special characters belonged equally between the genders, but what was interesting is that of the special characters placed in the middle of a password, so not at the beginning or the end, 26% of such passwords belong to women and 74% to men. So even more noteworthy was that the special characters used only, by, uh, only used by the women in this sample were the at symbol, the hash and percentage signs. And only the men chose the underscore, the dollar and question mark symbols. There were even more definite differences between the genders on the, their choice of password. So women were over three times more likely to use their first name in their password than men, but men were over twice as likely to use their surname in their passwords. Men were also almost four times more likely to use their first name and surname in the same password than women, and nearly twice as likely to use their email account domain name in their password. Perhaps the most interesting uh, find of all, though, is um, the use of the first names in passwords. So I looked at whether the gender of the password owner affected the choice of first name used. Males were 1.39 times more likely to choose a female name as opposed to a male name. And out of the females choosing first names, they were over twice as likely to choose a male name. So what we have here, what we have here is that men are more likely to choose a female name and females are more likely to choose a male name for their password. So could this be why ships and other forms of transport like cars are traditionally given female names? Is this because the ship's engineers and owners were mostly men? The so standard theory on this is that ships are usually given female names because it symbolizes the protect protective goddess or the mother with its womb-like container vessel. I would propose that the more likely reason is that the ship's owners and designers were men who naturally thought of a female name as a ship, like a car or a password, is essentially an in inanimate object. Um, nothing more complicated than this. Likewise, if the ship's owners and engineers have been mostly women in the past, we might have seen more male name ships. 
public records are useful investigations to link common entities and to build a picture of any corporate relationships. So two apparently separate business entities may be shown to be linked through common uh, domain contact names and web service providers. Looking at domain registration records on local registries can sometimes reveal the uh, administrative and technical contact data as opposed to the others which remove this data due to privacy regulations. So in this example, we can see the contact address addresses of this particular website based in the United Arab Emirates by looking at this UAE based domain search site. Company records will sometimes contain useful information about a suspect, even when they've been altered, um, when, they've, when the suspect has altered some of their personal details on the official records to avoid detection. So regarding the official UK company records, uh, an online search of a director will show their month and year of birth, but on some official company documents, usually scans of paper records, such as change of director detail records, the full date of birth can be seen. So it's always worth checking uh, the uploaded company filing documents rather than just the on-screen records. Some directors have also been seen to deliberately misspell their name or swap their first and middle names to avoid detection. Open source data can also be obtained from exposed network devices owned by both companies uh, or private users. And this gives a little bit on what we can see with little technical skill necessary. So this 4G IoT Netcom device login screen was accessed over a browser and it wasn't necessary to log in to see the status details, which showed the IMEI, the MZ firmware and other information. And uh, this ne Nebra hotspot crypto miner device was accessible over this specific port and showed the device's version, uh, MAC address, helium miner address and frequency. The other example on the right shows the files accessible over anonymous FTP access on port 21 on a Samsung DVR device. So for legal purposes, anonymous system access is considered within the bounds of open source. And this has been verified with legal experts on cyber law. With suspected IP addresses, it's sometimes useful to look at the open ports, not just on the address in question, but on the other addresses uh, belonging to the same ISP and within the same range as they may belong to the same threat actor. So in this example, the vulnerability exploitation tool Metasploit was found to be running on port 3790 on the suspect address. And then other addresses in this range were searched to see if this port was open on them, which led to another address, which was found to have various hacking software um, accessible on port 80. Torrent peer connections can show IP address and country location. And this is quite useful for looking at those seeding or leaching data leaks as well as pirated content. The AirSpy server map shows users who have registered their software-defined radios as servers on the site and shows which are live, their location and other details like the operating system, the type of device in use, IP address and username. Um, and you can get the location coordinates of a particular SDR server and it's then possible to target surrounding radio frequency transmitters, including Wi-Fi hotspots, by using the advertised SDR server to scan for signals in the locality. This is still within the bounds of open source as the SDR server is in this case is meant to be accessed by the public. Other useful RF sites um, include open cell ID in order to see the location and details of cell towers and the Helium Explorer map, which shows the location of all the active Helium cryptocurrency mining devices. If you suspect a particular device of interest, either because of its owner, or geographical location, it's possible to find out more about the device model if it's an iPhone um, and has the find, find my iPhone service enabled and you know the user's iCloud credentials because one can skip the two-factor authentication in order to use the app via a browser. Obviously, this is a feature which is there by design as it allows users who have lost their phone to find it and they only need to log into iCloud to do this. And clearly, this is something that only those with the authority to use those credentials should do. So knowing the use that the user here has an iPhone 12, we can assume that ultra wide band uh, may be in use. And this information may be useful if conducting further assessments um, in the locality. So ultra wide band applications for phones include the Apple car key, media file transfers um, and connections with home IoT devices. So this app we created um, it extracts IP addresses from forensic artifacts. 
yeah, um, such as log files and flags if any belong to one of the pre, uh, sorry, popular free VPN services that do not require a credit card sign up. The assumption is that those who are seeking to conduct nefarious activities would be more likely to use services uh, without needing a credit card for greater anonymity. So this app highlights potentially suspicious source IP addresses. You just need to upload the log um, or paste the, the file text and the app extracts all the IP addresses and cross matches it with the ranges belonging to those VPN services which currently do not require a credit card to sign up for. I'm now going to show you some examples of putting all this into action with some recent actual cases, starting with this particular darknet uh, malware hack tool supplier. So cross-matching the username found on Alphabay with data in password leaks, we find a password containing uh, 1731. We also search uh, for this username uh, being used as a password, and this leads to finding a reference to another password containing the number 1731 and an email address. The password appeared to contain a first name. Other email addresses are also found being associated with the 1731 password, as well as two IP addresses for this user and a phone number all based in Algeria. A Google search was done for this phone number and first name, and we find this person and his associated uh, physical address. This case involved hunting a threat actor uh, who had breached a large telco. We had only a username to go on. So starting with a Google search of this name, we found a slight variant of it, um, and which led then to this tree of Savior site and showed a photo of, uh, of a user his Brazil country location and a Facebook profile link. So the profile name switched out, the profile name switched out letters for numbers in a, in a similar manner to the username. So we just swapped the letters back to get a, use, a surname. A search on the password leak list showed some passwords and a hotmail address. And then using the forgot password function on Google for this address, we found two phone devices associated with this account and on iCloud, and uh, one of these devices ended in the phone number 77. Searches of the Brazilian equivalent of John, along with this other information, led to a reference where a user by these details asked on a forum for a crack version of some gaming software, and also led to an account on the hacking forum Nulled. Although the previous Facebook profile um, had been deleted, it's still possible to locate, it was still possible to locate his Skype and Instagram profiles where there were lots of photos of him. The Instagram profile revealed his birthday, his probable work employer and his hometown in Brazil. And this also corroborated with the IP addresses found in the password leak list. Lastly, this involves searching for the identity of someone offering red list prohibited wildlife for sale, um, such as cheetah and lion cubs in various countries. The adverts contained a contact form and after we made this initial contact, we engaged in some email dialogue, uh, which got us an email address and phone number. A search for this number was made on WhatsApp as sometimes WhatsApp is useful for revealing mottos and profile pictures. Is that is possible to look for someone, uh, look someone up on WhatsApp uh, using the add a contact process without this person knowing you have done this. So on this occasion, WhatsApp didn't provide any information, but Skype and Gmail gave us a username and a partial Gmail addresses. So using a bit of guesswork with one of the redacted Gmail addresses, we found a person's name, business email, company names, country locate and country location. And further password email address and cr names cross matching on the password leak list brought up more leads which led to this export company based in South Africa, which I believe was being used to facilitate the export of illicit products such as pharmaceuticals as well as wildlife. So to conclude, I hope this helps with locating the source and identity of cyber breaches and criminal suspects. Cybersecurity consultants are usually more successful with answering the question of what an attacker did and how they did it and when, but rarely who has done something. So many thanks for listening. Um, I hope that was useful.